my name is Lynn Snodgrass. I'm the CEO of the Best Darn Chamber in Oregon, soon to be the Best Darn Chamber in the Pacific Northwest, but I've been told my goal for 2018 is to be the Best Darn Chamber in the United States. Um, I'm glad that I didn't commit to that before I had my review of... Um, I want to thank the, re the uh, presenting sponsors that we have here today to allow this event to take place. Riverview Community Bank. Larry, you were the last to arrive so that I could point that out. Thank you very much for your sponsorship. We appreciate you. I also want to thank our stakeholder sponsors. There are two um, stakeholder sponsors, Portland General Electric and Gresham Barlow School District. Portland General Electric, John Maloney, you're here today. Thank you very much. This issue is really important to PGE. Regardless of the issue, though, they have been solid sponsors of the Government Affairs event, and we uh, thank you for that. I also want to thank our media sponsor, Metro East Community Media, and Keith Thomas is here today. He has flyers that are out on the um, registration desk that show the rebroadcast on the back, so pick one of those up. Keith, thank you very much for the Metro East Community sponsorship. We appreciate you. And I also want, oh, you guys didn't applaud. Get me into trouble. I also want to acknowledge, as will you as well, the elected officials that are in our audience. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our mayor, Shane Bemis, mayor of Gresham, for attending today. Mayor, thank you. And Commissioner Lori Stegman is here with us today. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Are there any other elected officials to school board or thank you very much? You wanted the Multnomah or uh, the community college and the community college as well, right? Why would you come today? I mean, what, what does cap and trade have to do with the community college? Don't answer that question because our speakers are going to. So there you go. Don't want to put you on this spot. But thank you for your service as well. And I want to also acknowledge our board members that are with us today, the chamber board members. First, I want to start with our new president for 2018, and that's Stacy Bloom of Skyland Pub. Thank you, Stacy. <laughs> and our old president, Warner Allen. No, I'm kidding. Our, our past, past president, Warner Allen. President-elect from Transamerica Financial Advisors, Jim Hathaway. Jim, where are you sitting? Thank you, Jim. We've already recognized John Maloney. He is a board member. He's with Portland General Electric. John, thank you for being here and for being a board member. And I have two more. Corey Price of Gresham Grocery Outlet. Corey, there you are, Corey. Thank you. And one of our newer board members representing Adventist Health, Dave Chachuk. Where is he? There he is. Thank you. I hope I didn't miss anybody. What I did, I did. Oh, Dean Funk from PGE. He's not on my script, so he doesn't get announced. So. <gasps> okay, never make, okay. Uh, just a minute, never make a mistake about a board member who buys ink by the truckload, but also somebody that could put me in cold storage or tell about, my, tell about me on Motorola. So having said that, I also want to include three more board members. Steve Brown from the Gresham Outlook and Pamplin Media. Thank you, Steve, for being here. James Denmark from Henningsen Cold Storage. Thank you, James. Appreciate you being here. And Ben Labus with Day Wireless and Motorola. D ben, thank you for coming, too. And Julie, we need to talk. There we go. Um, it is um, a really impressive that so many of our board members are here today. Thank you for your additional service. Okay, I had a New Year's resolution to lose weight. How many of you did that? I'm here to tell you I've accomplished my goal. I've only gained two pounds so far this year. Um, so if you have those kinds of goals and aspirations, just come to me and I'll tell you how you can not do what you said you're going to do. Now on the tables, um, on our table is a vase. An empty vase on a glass mirror. You might think we forgot something when we set the table today. We didn't. Typically, when I decorate our tables, it's thematic. 
it has something to do with our speaker. For instance, when Dr. Pereira, the new superintendent of Gresham Barlow came, on the table in those, those cylinder vases were crayons and pencils and rulers, things that were all about school. When we had Jack Roberts come talking about lottery, we had inside uh, Monopoly money, we had dice around it and all that kind of thing. Well, this vase depicts what we're gonna talk about today. Inside your vase is fresh air. Today's topic is all about wanting fresh air, good clean air. Also inside that vase is the goal of the people that want cap and trade to make sure that we have absolutely no carbon footprint whatsoever. Have it be empty. That too is there. The third representation is what our businesses and storefronts will look like in the direction that we're going. I haven't even come to the punchline yet. <laughs> what our businesses might look like and feel like if the direction that we're going with this particular legislation is, is, uh, comes about. There will be a lot of emptiness, a lot of where do we go next. So that empty vase is intended on representing all three things today. Going back to the fresh air, who in the room doesn't want that? But how we get there is what we're talking about today. So that being said, I am going to now turn the meeting over to the chair of our Government Affairs Council and the owner and operator of PDG Construction Services, Brian Lessler. Brian, come on up. Applause, applause, applause. Thank, Thank you, you, dear. Are you okay? Yeah, am I okay? I don't know. These folks are going to let me know here in a little bit, right? Yes, I will. <clears throat> so I thought we were going to talk about Warner's lottery tickets today, but apparently we're going to talk about greenhouse gases and cap and trade. So I'm curious, um, how many of you in this past week uh, at your dinner tables were discussing cap and trade in greenhouse gases? Anybody? Look at that. I mean, seriously. <laughs> That's pretty cool. A about four of you, or five of you, were actually talking about this. Um, I know that as Oregonians, the vast majority of us strive uh, to be responsible in everything we do on a daily basis um, and all the decisions that we make with respect to our environment. <clears throat> Making progress to be environmentally responsible is kind of an Oregon ideal. But before the legislature in a few weeks uh, is a major change <clears throat> and what many of us would call a burden toward that goal. So the topic today is all about climate change. <clears throat> you can argue about the science, but <clears throat> Climates change. I mean, remember what was outside this time last year? Yeah, about this time last year, you probably couldn't have got up the hill. <clears throat> and these climate changes really have, uh, could have a very immediate effect um, on our economy, on our economic climate as a whole. Um, and so today we have a couple of um, folks who are well versed in, in the issues surrounding uh, this topic. We have with us uh, Rebecca Carey Smith from PGE who will discuss uh, their approach uh, to this issue. And uh, we also have uh, with us uh, J.L. Wilson who's the owner of um, a firm called Public Affairs Council, and he is um, a lobbyist to the Oregon um, State Chambers of Commerce. So first uh, up th th today is JL, and JL, we would like to ask you to reflect on what is cap and trade and why should we actually care about it? Thank you, it's my 
great honor to talk to you today about cap and trade and just uh, so we clear the air of any misconceptions I, I'm a business lobbyist I represent business in the capital in this state um, it's never without its challenges in fact you could say it's probably uh, more adversity uh, than not uh, representing business in this state but coming at cap and trade I just want to be very clear my clients oppose it uh, we don't support it. We think it's a, a, a bad policy for where we are at this state at this point in time. And I'll, I'll do a little 30,000 foot view of what cap and trade is. And then I want to go into sort of our thought process and why you're going to see industries. Uh, I represent the food processing industry. I represent the metals manufacturers. I represent uh, the statewide network of chambers of commerce and why business has gone through the thought process and arrived at a position that cap and trade is not just unnecessary, it's unaffordable uh, and uh, our economy uh, can't uh, support it. And so I just want to lead you through, I just want to be very clear about how we approach that issue, where we're coming from, and so you can uh, view me in the proper context as I, as I make my uh, remarks about cap and trade. Um, cap and trade in a very brief nutshell is um, an attempt to put a price on carbon, uh, to put a price on carbon pollution. And to do that, uh, you have to acknowledge that we want less carbon in the air, which is something that I think we can all agree to. Uh, but how you go about it, I think, really matters, uh, particularly on the cost of doing business in the state of Oregon. If you're a manufacturer, if you're a food producer, if you're a farmer, uh, if you're uh, a, a utility. And those all have significant pass-through costs to Oregon consumers. So, Cap and trade is uh, an attempt to put a price on carbon. And how that works in the bill that will be considered in the 2018 legislature is there will be a price on carbon for anyone who emits over 25,000 tons of carbon into the air. So just think of it this way. If you, if you emit more than 25,000 tons, you will have to, in essence, uh, buy allowances from the state that allow you to emit more than 25,000 tons. So you're purchasing the right to emit more than 25,000 tons. And that process and that program is administered by the State Department of Environmental Quality, the DEQ. The DEQ sets up the marketplace. The DEQ sets up the parameters. Uh, I guess in theory, the DEQ would set the price of carbon and all that process would be administered by the state's DEQ, would capture, uh, uh, in, in this case, the proponents want to capture $700 million a year. $700 million a year, uh, essentially the tax that would be uh, implemented to, or, or the, the revenue that would uh, be gained by the cap and trade program, $1.4 billion. Uh, a budget cycle. So we're talking real money here. We're talking, I'd say, economy changing type of money. And uh, again, what are the intended uses of the money? Well, it gives the business a choice, at least in theory. I can invest in control technologies to limit my carbon or to uh, implement processes to reduce my carbon footprint. That's choice A. Or choice B, pay the allowance uh, to the DEQ for my right to emit more carbon than the cap would allow. So that's really the fundamental choice that's put in play by putting a price in carbon. Uh, the 700 million is the projected amount that would be raised. That should probably tell you something uh, that a lot of companies engaging in business in Oregon today already have the maximum uh, control technology in place for carbon emissions, the very ability to do business uh, means that they have to emit over uh, that threshold. And so I just want to be clear about how that, how that system works and then also want to be clear about why you should care and why we're talking about it. And the reason we're talking about it is because this will be the issue of the 2018 legislature. Uh, maybe you haven't heard it before and it's this arcane topic and I, I, I totally get when my eyes glazed over the first time I heard cap and trade because I mean it's just it's technical it's 
you just get lost in the weeds, okay? It doesn't capture people's imagination or attention. But I just wanna tell you, it is the issue. Um, it has been staged to be the issue in the 2018 legislature, and if it does not come to pass in the 2018 legislature, I can assure you it will be the issue in 2019 and 2020 and probably for the foreseeable future uh, as long as there's pressure to exert this type of uh, system. So uh, that's the reason you care, because it's going to dominate the public debate uh, in Salem for at least uh, this, this short session, which is coming to... Um, fruition here on February 5th. So let me talk about uh, the, the, the process that we've gone through to um, uh, look at cap and trade and why at least you'll see the business sector come to a determination that we are not going to be supportive of cap and trade um, uh, right now. You see, I wanna talk a little bit about Oregon's carbon profile. This really gets to the question of what problem are we trying to solve? I uh, want to talk about California's job growth experience because, of course, we're only doing this because California's doing it, of course. And uh, I think learning from their experience will probably be instructive. Um, I want to talk about the problems with Senate Bill 1507 and House Bill 4001. Those are the two bill numbers for this session, the 2018. You're going to see Senate Bill 1070. I just haven't updated all my slides. Senate Bill 1070 was the old iteration, but we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, but the new bills this session will be Senate Bill 1507, House Bill 4001, and then some concluding thoughts. Um, here's, here's a little bit about Oregon's carbon profile. The first point I want to impress upon you is the issue of carbon pollution in this state is not really an issue of uh, the industrial smokestacks uh, that like to be presented as we, we've got this runaway problem with, with carbon pollution in the states because we have all these huge polluting uh, industries in the state. Look at the carbon profile and look where uh, industrial is. Industrial represents 7% of Oregon's carbon emissions. You cannot have a discussion about carbon emissions unless you're really having a discussion about three sectors. Uh, your transportation sector, which is the, the gas you put in your car, um, at 36% uh, electricity use, at 30% natural gas use, at 14%. 80% of our carbon emissions, of the problem we're trying to solve, comes from those three things. Uh, you're driving your car, you're flipping the switch to your, your home lighting or your ability to heat your home. Those are the three sectors uh, that you're talking about with respect to our, our carbon uh, profile. And the reason I bring this up is not just to disabuse you of this notion that we've got this smokestack problem and you've got all these uh, bad actors uh, in the industrial sector. The issue here is that all three of these sectors hit everyday Oregonians like you and I. If you're going to take $700 million out of the economy, you're going to do it primarily through uh, transportation, electricity, and natural gas. Um, those, of course, flow right through to you and me in, in the rates that we pay. And so that's, I, I, I wanna make that connection for you that when we're talking about greenhouse gas emission and the problem we're solving, it's really a function of those three sectors. Now let me add a little more on top of that. Remember the transportation sector, we've passed the low carbon fuel standard, which reduced the carbon intensity of our transportation fuel by 10%. That just went into effect in the last 12 months. We passed a uh, massive transportation uh, investment package in the legislature that had huge investments in electrification of the transportation grid. We're talking about zero emissions vehicles, massive um, uh, investments into that. You had big investments into transit. We're going to all be paying an employer tax now to fund statewide transit. So we are already paying or purporting to pay uh, new taxes for to deal expressly with the transportation carbon issue. And though the ink isn't even dry on those things yet. Okay, so my first point is, can we hold off on cap and trade talk till we see how these type of policies uh, affect the transportation sector and greenhouse gas emissions coming out of that sector. The electricity sector, 30% of our, our GHG profile. Uh, remember the Coal to Clean Act two years ago? We are eliminating coal from our electric mix 
our generation mix uh, within the next, uh, I think, 10 years. Uh, we are going to a 50% renewable standard by 2040. We have the most aggressive renewable policies in the country right here in Oregon, and those have been implemented less, we're, we're less than 12 months into that scheme. Would it not make sense to let the benefits of those policies start to unfold before you overlay a $700 million tax uh, on these sectors that, that you and I will pay? And then finally, uh, on the natural gas side, um, somebody smarter than me will probably have to talk about any new measures on the natural gas side, but I know in terms of transportation and electricity, uh, we've had very significant carbon reduction measures passed by the legislature that have yet to really been put into practice. Uh, and and um, to me, it speaks of the, the, the premature uh, nature of, of rolling out a cap and trade discussion. Uh, let's talk about Oregon as a carbon emitter. We have the sixth lowest uh, CO2 emissions per capita. Uh, again, really get to getting to the issue, what problem are we trying to solve in the state? Uh, when Oregon has about 1.5% of the national population, we account for 0.7% of total U.S. Uh, carbon emissions. So our, our carbon emissions per person are, are uh, significantly less than what our population would otherwise uh, dictate. And this number at the bottom, that's the one that really gets me. Uh, Oregon is responsible for one-tenth of one percent of global CO2 emissions. And so really the question, the cost-benefit question that comes to us and our, our business clients is, is it worth $1.4 billion out of the economy to put a little tiny dent into that 0.1% of global emissions. I mean, talk about the cost benefit. Uh, is it worth it to hamstring our economy for the purposes of just putting a, a, a small dent in that fraction of that 0.1% of global emissions? To me, that's the cost benefit analysis that business people do when they look at a policy and they look at the cost, they look at the benefits, and is the benefit of that small reduction. Because keep in mind, we're never going to eliminate all of our, our, our GHG. Uh, we're, we're just talking about putting a dent into that point one. So we might eliminate a fraction of it, say 5%, 10%, and is that worth it to you uh, for a $700 billion a year tax? Just want to talk about uh, Oregon's progress, again, speaking to the issue of um, the problem we're trying to solve here since year 2000. Year 2000 was our high watermark as a state with carbon emissions. The state in general from industrial, electric, natural gas, transportation sources uh, emitted 72 million tons of greenhouse gas. Uh, we are now at 63 million tons. So in that span of 15 years, our economy has essentially doubled. Our population has increased by 18%. And yet through all of that growth, we have actually uh, materially reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions from 72 million tons to 63 million tons. That would speak to me of progress uh, being made without uh, the need for a cap and trade system. Uh, we're doing it primarily through um, uh, low intensity, uh, low carbon intensity of our energy supply. We have the third lowest CO2 intensity in our energy supply of any state in the nation, and even that has gone down 8% in the last 15 years. And bookmark that lowest uh, state CO2 uh, intensity of our energy supply, because I really want to come back to uh, the issue of, okay, if not cap and trade, then what? Uh, I, you know, I've, I re represented business for many years, and I, I always encourage my clients to talk about what you're for. I, I can tell, you know, the great thing about representing business, largely they just want to be left alone. And so we, we, sh we can articulate in great detail everything we oppose. Uh, but talking about what we support and the kind of things that we would uh, purport to do is something entirely different. But I want to bookmark that number, uh, the third lowest C, uh, carbon intensity of our energy supply. Uh, how is it being done? This is just one sector um, that I think is pretty indicative of how this will go and current trends in the marketplace. And this is the pulp and paper. Uh, this accounts for, I think, about 5% of 
uh, industrial CO2 emissions. No, this, this accounts for about 5% of total Oregon CO2 emissions. And you see that there has been a reduction in CO2 emissions in that sector of about 58% uh, in the past decade. Now, you'll see part of that red bar. Uh, unfortunately, th those are mill closures. But the green bar is still less. In fact, it's 33% uh, lower from 2014 to 2005. And really, what we're talking about there is uh, energy recapture uh, with combined heat and power technology. And these are just, these are industry specific things that are put into play because it's in the pulp and paper mill's best interest to recapture, uh, in this case through biomass, and to heat and, and generate power for their own facilities. And so these things are happening already without uh, a state cap and trade mandate. And th this is probably one of the largest um, uh, CO2 emitting sectors. And you can see even in the last decade, uh, there's been a phenomenal decline in CO2 emissions um, just due to uh, innovation, innovation in the industry. I uh, want to talk about California's job experience uh, under the uh, auspices of a cap and trade program. A lot has been said about uh, economic growth in California, uh, even with a cap and trade system in place. Uh, this illustrates, I think, pretty succinctly that manufacturing job growth in California has stalled uh, relative to national growth uh, under the um, uh, under a, a cap and trade scheme. So national growth in manufacturing, 8.5 percent. Employment growth, California's growth in the same time, 4.1 percent in the time that they've um, uh, had a cap and trade in state. And also uh, California unemployment rates by county. Really, the California economy right now being driven by the Bay Area, not even so much in, in Southern California anymore. Largely, the state has unemployment that is at or above national averages, with the exception of the uh, Bay Area. Problems, uh, and these are just direct costs. When you talk about uh, a $700 million uh, extraction uh, from the private economy. Uh, I want to be very clear about what that portends for individuals and households. Uh, this is done through the economic modeling, through FTI Consulting, who has done the economic modeling for uh, industry in the state. Um, the average cost per household is going to be $600 to $1,500 per year, $50 to $125 a month. And when I talk about that, keep in mind, I'm talking about three direct costs. I'm talking about transportation fuel, the price you pay at the pump. I'm talking about your electricity bill. I'm talking about your natural gas bill. So we can account for those three bills directly uh, increasing by more than $50 per month uh, for the uh, average Oregon household. So between $600 and $1,500 a year in increased direct costs, this does not include anything with respect to indirect costs, uh, pass-through costs because uh, your food costs are higher, uh, because um, uh, the other costs that you incur are higher due to uh, the pass-through uh, in the economy. So these are just direct costs. Uh, part of that is a 16 cent per gallon uh, increase in the price of transportation fuel. This is immediately. Um, for shock value, I will tell you if you project this out over the course of 25 to 30 years, uh, where we anticipate a baseline cost per gallon of, of transportation fuel to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $4 to $4.50. Uh, 25, 30 years from now, it will cost $7.50 under a cap and trade proposal in 30 years. And then finally, the uh, $700 million annual tax. I don't personally know how the proponents will get to $700 million. I just take the proponents at their word that this is their goal that they want to reach. Um, but how, the, the amount of money that's generated by this program, I think it's safe to say is anyone's guess. But you can look back in the Oregonian headlines and, and all the legislative material. The, the goal clearly is to uh, uh, collect $700 million per year. Uh, we're pro projecting significant uh, job declines um, uh, f up to 5,000 on the immediate horizon. Uh, over time, that stretches to about 17,000. 
This will largely be in, in two sectors, manufacturing one, as the industrial base uh, uh, moves out. You're, you're going to hear that commonly referred to as leakage. And then uh, the second, interestingly, is going to be state and local government. Uh, as, as industrial property tax bases, you're going to see significant job losses, as we're projecting, uh, in state and local government due to contracting uh, tax bases. Now, this bill is being called now the Clean Energy Jobs Act. Um, I suppose they ha I mean, I, we're, we play this game all the time. You find a title for the bill that you think resonates and gets people's support. And I want to make clear, there are some sectors that will see growth. Um, as a result of a cap and trade, construction being one of them. Uh, but the net, the net effect is going to be a job loss. So I do want to, you know, in, in some respects, you will have industries that will experience gains. On the whole, you will experience uh, a net loss. Um, this is one of the things, just from a process standpoint, uh, that would get me and I would hope would get you. And that is, you're, for the first time, you're, you're essentially giving a state agency the power uh, to implement and raise these taxes. And w when was the last time you had recourse over the uh, DEQ uh, if they wanted to raise your costs? I mean, there's n no one's accountable. Um, it's not like a, a legislature or a legislator going back to you and they have to run for re-election every two years. But keep in mind, this program and the taxes that are implemented in this program are implemented at the agency level. And so we, we talk about uh, the costs incurred on your, your, your fuel, your electricity, and natural gas. Uh, these costs will be uh, implemented essentially a tax at the agency level uh, without a vote of the people, without a vote of the legislature. And, you know, and another feature is how the money is spent. Um, I suspect that there's probably no, uh, unless you had just an ironclad plan, I, I know one of the failings of Measure 97 and, and all the others is, okay, what's the plan? You're going to get all this money, what is your plan? And that is not defined yet other than you do have, uh, you know, committees that are put together that uh, involve, I think, groups that are interested in this money. Uh, will be in charge of spending it. And so I would probably insist on a little more accountability uh, on, the, uh, on the spending side. Um, this is the last point that I want to make, and this gets to the issue of, of something called leakage. And the issue of leakage is what is going to happen when you make the cost of manufacturing and producing a product in the state of Oregon so expensive that they decide to manufacture that project, uh, product elsewhere. And the issue, again, we, we, it's, it's, it's commonly referred to as leakage, but you see that um, green line there at the far left, that is the carbon intensity of Oregon's energy supply. And then you see every other state to the right of it that is a state where an Oregon manufacturer could possibly choose to locate or produce those goods. In, the, in food production, you see uh, production from Oregon going to Kentucky, to Georgia. Uh, for manufacturing uh, heavy trucks, you see it easily going to North Carolina and South Carolina. And all of those states have a CO2 intensity in their energy supply that is sometimes four, five, six, seven times the carbon intensity of Oregon's energy. And so it really begs the question, what are we doing? Um, if we, is, are, are we saying because we're emitting less carbon within the boundaries of the state of Oregon that we're doing global climate change a favor because we're shipping it to a state that will, uh, that will ha has an energy supply that has five times the carbon intensity to it? Is that really a win? Uh, for global climate change, or are we saying it's a win for Oregon because we can show on paper that our carbon intensity is less? And this is really the question I would encourage all of you to ask. Um, what exactly are we doing if our strategy is to push manufacturing into other states that have a much higher level of carbon intensity in their energy supply? Which really then gets to what I think our strategy should be and what I think our vision should be. And if, if I could assure a manufacturer that they could come here and we wouldn't uh, overlay, uh, you know, ridiculous employment laws on them or tax laws or whatnot, I would go on a full throttle effort to encourage manufacturing in this state and to attract and recruit manufacturers from other states to come to Oregon because from a global environmental perspective, it is clearly the best thing to do. 
Now, what would it do for Oregon's emissions? Ah, uh, well, Oregon's emissions probably would go up. But do you want Oregon's emissions high or do you want North Carolina's emissions high? And from my perspective, if we're going to have uh, among the lowest carbon intensity of our energy supply, which keep in mind, if you're a manufacturer, your energy costs are probably your second biggest cost of doing business other than your personnel costs. These are tens of millions of dollars. Okay, it, it is a major, the major cost of doing business. I would argue that these environmentally responsible thing to do is to go on a full-scale offensive and to bring manufacturing to the state of Oregon to save the environment as opposed to pushing our manufacturing off into other states where the carbon intensity is much higher and the sensitivity is much lower uh, to those types of things. So just food for thought, but just to wrap it up in a bow, uh, that is why you're going to see industry opposition to this. I, you know, that's not to say there won't be businesses that support I would say if you're going to have a proposal to rob Peter to pay Paul, you're always going to get Paul's support. And this is, you're going to see that in, uh, in, in who comes out, either people who aren't affected or people who stand to gain some. I understand that. We all, we all compete in this economy, and I get that. But I want you to know, uh, with respect to chambers, the food processors, the metals manufacturing, the, the, the folks that produce things, produce family wage jobs, produce product and goods in this state, uh, you're going to see pretty strong opposition to cap and trade. And I at least wanted to guide you through the thought process on, on why that is so. So thank you for your time. It's been my pleasure. JL, before you leave, I'm sorry. Um, we've got another speaker from, Rebecca from PGE is going to come up, Brian's going to introduce her, but we've got we're, time right now if you want to ask one or two questions, then we'll hear Rebecca and there'll be time at the end for questions as well. So is there a burning question right now for JL? A burning question meaning there's no greenhouse gases around this burning part, so. Oh, sorry. I'll start over. JL, you said that um, one of the beneficiaries of this might be the construction industry. Could you expand on that? I'm in the construction business. I don't see it that way. I mean, I'd love to be Paul, but I really feel like Peter in this case. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't doubt. I mean, just keep in mind our, our modeling did a broad analysis of various. So that there, there could be construction of, uh, you know, various energy efficient uh, type. Projects, you know, th things like that. Uh, if if you're in home building, uh, you might not be uh, among the positively impacted groups. Kathy, is there anything in the bill to help large businesses transition? I had read somewhere that they were thinking about adding something, maybe for because of Intel. Sure, um, you know, this is something. This is just. You mean does everybody want to talk frankly here? I mean. This is the part of, of buying off support. You, you, ha you have to, if, you're, if you come in with the premise that industry opposes, then you have to start picking off, okay, who can we get to support and what goodies can we give them in order to get that type of support. So you're going to see that this phrase come up, uh, the uh, energy impacted trade, energy, energy intensive trade impacted sectors. Um, and so what, what can we do so that uh, they can pollute for free, essentially? And so you're going to start to divvy up classes of people, uh, and, and some will fall under the, 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 uh, you know, the uh, cap and trade scheme, and some won't. And you know, part of it's done for economic reasons, because you don't want food production to, you know, you don't want Boardman Foods to pick up and leave Boardman because who's going to employ people in that town, okay? So that's one consideration. But then the second consideration is a political consideration. Um, you know, who can we absolutely af not afford to have come in and oppose the bill? So I would, I would very much expect those discussions to be had in Salem with respect to, okay, who are we going to let off the hook a little bit? Uh, for economic reasons or for political reasons. And so it wouldn't surprise me at all. Uh, that, that, that there will be discussion of, of those types of situations. And the last point I'll make, because I know Lynn wants to give me the hook, and that is if you're going to start giving stuff away, you're not going to hit that $700 million number that everybody wants to raise. And believe me, that money is already spent. Okay? It's like Measure 97. You know, we're all told it was a fait accompli, and that $6 billion was already spent. 
uh, the week before Election Day because what a shock it was that it didn't pass. And this is a different, this is a same, this is the same song, different verse. Uh, there have been all sorts of promises made with respect to how that's money gonna, is going to be spent because you need different constituency groups to come in and say that this is a good thing and we're going to get the money, it's going to help with X, Y, and Z. Um, but you're not going to get it if you start handing out freebies, uh, which is exactly the point you're, you're making. And so uh, those discussions are very fluid. Uh, I, the, the fact that um, I, I don't think anybody's landed on any uh, specific proposal there yet. Thank you. Thanks. Next up, uh, from PGE, who has been working on this issue for quite some time, Rebecca Carey Smith is going to enlighten you as to uh, their approach and strategy on this complex issue. Rebecca, please welcome her. Good to see you again. Thank you. Hi there, uh, Rebecca Carey Smith. I work on the state government affairs team at PGE, and I'm excited that I have three former and current PGE employees in the audience that can correct me if I if I go astray. Um, so I'm here today to talk a little bit about uh, PGE's position um, on cap and trade and how we're approaching conversations down in Salem. And is it the right one? All right, want to make sure I knew how this worked. Okay. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to give a little bit of background about PGE and some of our clean um, energy future planning. I've condensed, I think, three a uh, presentation of 30 slides into three slides, so <laughs> uh, forgive me for being brief. Um, but quickly, PGE serves um, 51 cities and six counties in Oregon. So we're in Oregon headquartered, um, and we exclusively, exclusively serve um, electricity in Oregon. And the grid has been, uh, is changing pretty drastically, and, and that's changing how we approach our planning processes and, and um, how we deliver energy. So there's three quick things that I wanted to mention before we go into cap and trade um, that give context to how we're approaching discussions. The first one is there is a, there's a lot more technology than there's ever been um, in the electricity sector. So, you know, 20 years ago, it was a lot of one-way flow. There was generation out in rural areas, like our Boardman plant or our Port Westward plant that are in um, rural communities, and then we deliver it into our service territory. So one-way flow. Now it's changed a lot. There's a lot more multi-directional flow that's um, come about because of changes in technology. So think about um, driving through Portland or Gresham, you might see solar on people's rooftops. They are producing solar for their home, but they might be directing it back into the grid as well. So um, multi-directional flow. Um, there's a lot more generation that's happening locally as well. So you'll see those solar panels. Um, you may see storage in people's homes um, so they can store energy. So it's not just rural areas bringing um, electricity into urban centers anymore. Much more multi-directional. And that causes um, differences in how we manage the grid. Um, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, there's also some um, issues that we will have to address as we go along. Um, so with energy management, there's opportunities because of that technology to save the amount of energy that we would otherwise use. Um, we project to, in our newest integrated resource planning um, proposal, to save about 250 megawatts of energy, which is the equivalent of a wind farm. Another thing that happened is that we joined the energy imbalance market, which linked us up um, to California and other states. And that's a big opportunity for our customers. So instead of perhaps turning on our plant at Port Westward, which produces natural gas to, to uh, it's a natural gas plant to deliver electricity, we might be able to buy excess solar from California um, and deliver it to um, our customers' homes, uh, which saves them money because it's cheaper to buy from excess solar that California would not be using than it would be to turn on our plant. So opportunities there. And the third one is more renewables. So JL mentioned that uh, Oregon has a 50% renewable standard. So by 2040, 50% of the energy that Portland General Electric will deliver will come from renew, new, renew, re, new renewable resources. Excuse me. Um, by 2035, uh, we will stop um, including coal in our customers' electric rates. So the idea is to be completely off coal. Um, so with that, with all of those different ways that we're managing the grid, producing electricity, we expect to be at a 70% carbon-free um, 
uh, generation by 2040. So carbon-free is, imp is an important nuance. Uh, there's 50% renewable and then also carbon-free, which is hydro, which is not considered renewable um, at the federal level. So it's a big transition from today when we're at 40% carbon-free. So thinking about cap and trade and thinking about how we're planning for our future, um, we've approached conversations in Salem and approached the work groups um, with a couple of key things. First is uh, climate change is real and PGE believes it's a critical issue that we need to address and PGE is committed to achieving our proportionate share of Oregon's greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, second is we know that there are uh, our customers care about cleaner energy, renewable energy, and they care about affordable energy. So how do we um, integrate all of those values together to del deliver the product that our customers value? Um, and third, I just lost my train of thought, I'm so sorry. Um, and third is that we, um, as an electric utility that's um, regulated by the state, uh, there are direct mandates that we have that are leading to investments, and those investments are leading to reductions in the carbon content of our electric supply. So unlike a lot of other industry, um, we have direct regulation that is changing how we deliver our product. So with that, we have three top priorities for the Oregon Cap and Trade Program if Oregon lawmakers decide that that is the best program for Oregon. There are five or six others attached that, are, um, that go beyond this, but um, Cap and Trade is a complex issue and those other ones are more nuanced and complex. Um, but these priorities are as follows. Customers shouldn't have to pay twice for the same carbon reductions to the system. They shouldn't pay more than necessary, right? Second is that all PGE customers should be protected from unnecessary price increases. There shouldn't be winners and losers among our customer base. And the third is that the program should encourage um, switching to electricity as a cleaner energy source. So what does that all mean? I will go into that. So customers shouldn't pay twice. So currently, um, there are, are a number of ways that our customers are paying for reducing carbon on our system. Uh, right now, they pay about a 7% public purpose charge on their bill. That public purpose charge um, raises money to fund energy efficiency and some renewables. Uh, we have the 50% renewable mandate that I mentioned earlier from the Coal to Clean bill that was passed in 2016. Um, that will require investments in our system. Um, that will reduce carbon. Um, and if anyone knows how electric bills are created or electric rates are created is that when we build something, so we build a wind farm, the cost, the capital cost of that goes into our customers' rates, which is why customers are paying for those investments. Um, and then third, and this is customers volunteering to be part of our green energy program. So PGE has one of the most successful and largest green energy programs in the country. We have about 155,000 customers that volunteer to pay a little bit more on their bill to be part of that. So these investments are driving down emissions. Um, just to explain this chart a little bit so I can give you context is the line at the very top that ends in the triangle, that's what our emissions, we project our emissions would be without any of the investments that we're making to drive down emissions. So because of energy efficiency, because of our renewable portfolio standard, and because of our um, removing coal from our electric mix, electric mix, we're drastically reducing our emissions. So our emissions line is the one that the really curvy line that ends at the star in the middle of the chart. Now, with that, we only plan on a 20-year horizon, so this goes out to 2050. We don't know what our emissions are going to be in 2050 because we don't plan that far. But you can see that we're drastically driving down our carbon emissions. The lines that end in the star and the triangle, the line that ends in the triangle is the cap and trade goal. So by 2040, we're not that far off of meeting the goal that cap and trade is proposing right now. Um, by 2050, we, according to this chart, we're a little further off, but this chart assumes no new technology, no new regulation, um, no changes in the market power mix, which are unlikely scenarios. So customers are paying for those reductions in our system. So we don't think our customers, we think our customers should be protected from um, unnecessary rate increases. And actually before I 
move on, I'm gonna explain a little something so to provide some context. So the way cap and trade works is, and I know JL touched on it a little bit, is that about 100 companies would be part of the program and there's a cap, right? So the cap, think about the cap being that line that ends in the triangle. There's a cap that the state sets and the cap goes down over time. If you're an industry that emits more than 25,000 tons of CO2, you have to buy a permit for every ton of carbon that you emit, right? Not a, not a permit for every ton above the cap, a permit for every ton of carbon that you emit. So there are ways, so PGE under the current design would have to buy a permit for every single ton of carbon we emit up to the curvy line. That's our, our projected carbon emissions line. So customers are paying in their rates for the investments that are driving down the system, right? They would then have to pay in their rates again for the cost of the permit to comply with the program. So that's the pay twice piece. Now there are ways to mitigate that um, by how you design the program and that would help avoid customers from paying twice and that's how allowances are allocated. So your allowance is your permit, the permit you have to purchase or the permit that you are given by the state or the permit that you're consigned by the state. So some industries are given direct allocation of permits, which means they don't have to buy them. So it's to help them, um, it protects them. It's a price mitigation. Um, others have to purchase it or there's a consignment mechanism where they're given some, then they have to sell them on the market and we would be linked to the, Californ the Western Climate Initiative market, which includes California, Ontario, and Quebec. We'd sell them on the market and then we'd have to take the proceeds of that and rebate it to some of our customers and then purchase permits on top of that in order to comply with the program. So the rebate mechanism would be a way to, as designed to help mitigate the cost impact to our customers. But the issue with the rebate program is that only some customers would get a rebate and there's no guarantee that the rebate would offset the increased costs that they had on their electric bill. There's no guarantee that all customers would get a rebate and that all customers would be made whole. So that goes, does, does that make sense in a quick snapshot? So that goes to, we wanna protect all customers from unnecessary rate increases. So the design would have to change in order to make sure that all customers don't pay an unnecessary amount for the same carbon reduction. And that's important to us. So we serve 870,000 customers. That's about 50% of Oregon's population. So even though we only serve that little sliver at the top of the, the Oregon map, um, it's a significant portion of the Oregon's population. They are rural customers, they're suburban, they are urban. Um, we also serve about 75% of the state's commercial and industrial activity. So we have a lot of commercial customers as well. Um, of our 752,000 residential customers, about 20% of them need um, bill, assistance, bill assistance each month, which means they need help paying their electric bill. About 5% of customers actually get the assistance that they need. Um, so we think keeping bills affordable as we drive down our emissions is very important. Um, and then the third piece that we, uh, our third priority for the design of the bill is that it should encourage electrification. So what does that mean? So there's a lot of talk about um, in the energy community about deep decarbonization. So a way to drive down um, carbon emissions um, through deep decarbonization. Um, there are three pillars. One is make electricity cleaner. So take the carbon out of electricity. PG is working toward a 70% carbon free goal by 2040. The second pillar is don't use as much energy. So save energy through energy efficiency. And you know, think about switching from a, um, to LED light bulbs is a really good example of that. But we need to use less and we need to be more efficient about what we use. And the third is called end use electrification. So as electricity becomes cleaner and the carbon content decreases, and electricity is the currently the easiest type of energy to make clean, we want to encourage switching to electricity to drive down carbon emissions in other sectors. So a really good example of that is instead of a gas-fueled vehicle, driving an electric vehicle, right? So as uh, your electric vehicle is charged with cleaner energy, you're driving down carbon um, content in the transportation sector. So we want to keep energy as affordable, electricity as affordable as possible to drive down carbon emissions in other parts of the economy. And that's important because right now about 23% of the energy economy is electricity. By 2050, that's predicted to be about 50%. And that's gonna come from 
people switching from, you know, a um, from uh, to a from natural gas to a heat pump for their homes. It's going to come from people switching from a gas car to an electric car, which I think by 2040 they think about 30% of all car sales will be um, electric. At least 30% will be electric. So it's important to keep electric electric rates affordable um, as we work toward our carbon reduction goals. So that's it. <laughs> that's PGE's priorities um, for cap and trade. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> So um, we've got a little time for some questions. You can ask Rebecca a question, or JL can pop up and answer question two. Do I hear one? See one? Yes. Here we go. Um, good morning, or good afternoon. Um, so my question is, is that Oregon is doing this. California has done it. Do I understand that they have? California has a cap and trade program that was um, that began in 2013, yes. Okay, and then Washington State has also got legislation. Washington is doing a carbon tax, which is different than a cap and trade program. They're considering a carbon tax in their um, current legislative session. So since AIR does not just stand in one state alone, are there discussions that can kind of be more regional in focus? So um, that might be a question if other people want to take it, but I can say that it, in cap and trade program, we would be linked to the Western Climate Initiative, which is linked to California and Ontario and Quebec. So we, we're not isolated in a state. Um, so it is, in that frame, more of a regional conversation. Mayor has a question. Thank you. I don't really have a question, maybe just a comment for some perspective from the region. So I have the opportunity to chair the Metropolitan Mayors Consortium, which is made up of 26 of the uh, metropolitan uh, area mayors. This discussion came up on cap and trade, whether or not we uh, should endorse it, not endorse it, stay out of it, whatever. We had a very robust uh, conversation about, um, about where the bill was going, where we thought we could uh, not weigh in. We decided ultimately to not weigh in generally because we felt like there were other issues that the legislature should deal with, like maybe a failing education system right now. We did not agree that they should have $700 million to, dis to spend however they wanted to. Um, the other, it wasn't necessarily for us, it wasn't a conversation on whether climate change was real or not. It was about giving the legislature $700 million uh, to spend however they saw fit. Based on the track record that they have, we didn't think that that was necessarily prudent. We also felt as mayors that have all made uh, great strides uh, in, in trying to reduce the carbon footprint in their c cities, very practically, they're doing that uh, already. And when you look at all of the green power communities, there's like 67 or so that are listed on the website. I think 13 of those cities are from the state of Oregon, and that's in, for, across the entire country. So we are doing a lot a, a, uh, on this topic already, and we trust, the mayors felt that they trusted the business community to make the right choices, make the right investments, particularly business people understanding um, return on investment, and if they invest in some of the technologies that have both been iterated today, that the return will pay off and have a better uh, uh, return for their rate payers. In Gresham, it's been almost a million dollars a year savings just on what we've done at the wastewater treatment plant. So we felt like we're moving the ball forward and business is moving the forward. If we leave business alone, they're gonna be fine. So, Mayor, I just wanna be clear. You said that the mayor's consortium is not weighing in. That means they're not supporting the um, cap and trade of the legislature. Is that clarifying? Yeah, we had, so the subcommittee, the energy subcommittee came forward with a recommendation to support it. Uh, the broader group decided not to support it, which was immediately followed by a motion to support it, which did not pass either. So we're just staying out of it. We felt that um, we're a very new group and we felt that we need to stay together and this wasn't one that we thought we would break our pick off on, that um, each individual mayor and their community can speak to what they've done or been able to do um, and have that conversation based on their own uh, city council or, or perspective, so. Thank you for that clarification, clarification, and thanks for saving us a million bucks every year. That's a pretty cool thing. Sue? Thank you. I'm not sure that I really actually have a question either, but uh, more of a comment. So um, I chair the East Metro Economic Alliance, and this issue's been a major concern for us over actually the last... I'd say three or four years, we've been gradually becoming more and more educated. And 
This particular measure really is a major impact for our particular area. The manufacturing that's here, our food industries, and even those that are impacted because of the number of trucks that they have. So it is serious because this could be a major detractor for doing the kinds of things that we still want to see happen here with our available land. So, Yes, we, uh, out in our area, we need to pay real attention to this. So, and I appreciate it. You've been here a couple times to talk uh, from PGE, and it's been really interesting and informative. Thanks. Another question or comment from anyone here? Brian has one. I'm curious for either JL uh, or you, Rebecca, to Give us some idea of who's pushing, who's behind this cap and trade bill. Um, I'm, I'm suspicious that our state legislature hasn't just dreamed this up all by themselves. So who, who's the money, who's the power, who's, who are the lobbyists that are pushing this issue? I mean, JL, I don't know if you want to take that. I, I, I can say that, <laughs> I can say that um, from a more of a political perspective, we know that um, Oregonians, the uh, vast majority, believe that climate change is real. We know a vast majority are concerned about it. It may not be their top issue of concern, but there's concern about it. Um, and that uh, cap and trade is a program that exists already in California. Um, and cap and trade discussions have been happening in Oregon. Um, for a better part of a decade. That doesn't mean very detailed conversations about what the policy would look like have been happening, but there has, this is not the first time that this has been proposed in Oregon. And I'll, I'll let Jay, I'll take the other part of the question if you want to add to that. The, the question is who is who's pushing it and where did it come from? And um, we, we have a very strong environmental lobby in the state. And you think of Sierra Club or Renew Oregon or Environmental Council, and this, this is really sort of the next stage in in their progression. Uh, they were uh, uh, really invested in the uh, low carbon fuel standard. Uh, then they moved on to um, uh, the coal to clean, and this is sort of the next stage in their progression. So. Do, do I think, and you've got legislators that are very invested in that, uh, not just because there's political and personal philosophical alignments, but they do help people get elected. And so that, that's how um, you know, strategic alliances are, are, are built in the legislature, for better or worse. And, so, and we do the same thing on the business side. But um, th this is sort of the, the next stage of uh, the environmental movement. I think our, 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 one of our clear arguments is the other stuff hasn't even been baked yet uh, that's been passed, and it would be probably far more prudent to let the effects of that wind through the system before we talk about overlaying another regulation on top. So that's, you know, as concisely as I can answer that. All of the money. So are there any other questions? We've got time for one more. Yes, Juliet, hold on. Here you go. Um, I'm just curious about uh, the money that would be gained on the tax. You kind of touched on it, JL, specifically a few times, but usually when something like this is being brought to legislature, they usually there's a plan put into place of where money is going to go, like a percentage is going to go. So that's the part that I'm, I'm wondering. I feel like there's there's got to be more of an answer in there. Um, so again, Jay, I'll add to this if you want, but there, um, I, I don't know if the $700 million is a goal of the, the program. It's more of what a legislative impact, what they've determined that the, the program could raise in the first um, year, so $1.4 billion a biennium. Um, Ted, there was a great article in Oregon Live on Saturday that kind of breaks down um, both how cap-and-trade works, how different industries are impacted, and how the money would be spent. But a portion of that, I think 40%, would be allocated to the transportation sector because the Constitution says that money's raised um, through transportation needs to be dedicated to transportation. Um, the rest would be allocated um, by a 21-person uh, committee. Um, based on some priorities. Um, priority would go to um, addressing communities that have been disproportionately impacted by climate change. Um, so it's pretty open right now, but there is in the bill some overarching structure, um, but there's a lot of questions that remain about how it actually would be spent and, and what the bill means by some of the words that it uses. 
you gave me an uh, awesome segue to make some, say something that I wasn't going to say. Um, <clears throat> you, you, a tax requires a supermajority of the legislature to pass it, three-fifths majority. Um, you can bet your bottom dollar that the business community is going to challenge a cap and trade program on that grounds, uh, that, that it's not going to be paid, that it's not going to be uh, uh, passed the constitutional requirements of a three-fifths majority to pass the, both the House and the Senate, because there's no way they're going to get there. Um, we've got very strong legal arguments that this is a tax. You're basically taking $700 million and spending it. And, and so how legislative council, which is the legislature's lawyers, determined it wasn't a tax is, is kind of beyond us. But the reality is we're going to bring up that argument very uh, loudly. So that, that, that's one thing. And then with respect to the money, just, I, I just always get a chuckle when you say, well, this is the clean energy jobs bill because we're going to spur this big industry that wouldn't otherwise exist without subsidies. And, but before we spend that money, we got to give money to pay for people's energy bills who can't afford them. So we're going to break off a chunk of the money to do energy bill assistance. And there's the just transition fund because you're going to have to retrain people who lost their jobs in traditional manufacturing to reach. It would actually come through the, the energy system would come through the consignment. So it would be, this my understanding, it's not part of that stuff. It's always not part of seven. Well, gosh, Rebecca, who invited you? No, I'm just. Uh, no, I'm always. Hey, listen, I'm. Always, you can. Uh, facts matter, and so uh, you know, cancel everything I just said. But the, the 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 reality is, you're not getting the 700. You're not getting a dollar for dollar spend on uh, new business development or new industry development. That money is parsed out a hundred different ways before you get to, well, we're going we're gonna to try to launch an industry that wouldn't otherwise exist without the uh, subsidy. So that's just something that I personally just grates on me, yeah. uh, but I, I think is a salient point uh, related to your question. So what do you think? Are you overdosed on cap and trade? commonly known as crap and something else, or I'm not sure what. Thank you, JL, and thank you, Rebecca, so much for joining us today, and um, we appreciate you. Uh, one thing before I go into my thank yous, um, I can't remember if it was JL or if it was Rebecca, referred to there are 100 companies in Oregon that are going to be affected. Microchip is one of them. Um, they're in our backyard. They are, um, they are what college students at Mounted Community College aspire to go and be hired from. Uh, we're thinking that On Semiconductor is on that list too, but as On Semi, they're not on the list of 100 companies. But it's in our backyard, not to mention it's at our homes when we turn the lights on and off. So it is here, it is real, and we need to protect um, microchip as much as we can so they can continue to do business in Gresham, in Oregon. All right, so thank you for that. And thank you also. Dean Funk, would you stand up, please? <laughs> Dean Funk with PGE. He is a sponsor, a stakeholder sponsor of our event here. Dean, thank you very much, he, along with John Maloney. And I also want to thank Larry Schwartz. And I want to thank Gresham Barlow School District and Metro East Community Media. Don't forget to pick up a rebroadcast on your way out so you can listen to this all over again and saturate yourself with information. Want to show, uh, tell you what's coming up next month. Again, the uh, Business and Leaders Lunch is the day after a holiday. It's President's Day. The next day is the Business and Leaders Luncheon. And we have Bob Packwood. Senator Packwood is going to be here. He was the author of the last time our um, federal government put a tax reform together. He was the author of that. He's going to talk about how the behind the scenes happened then. Then he's going to fast forward 100 years and talk about our, the legislation now and how it has affected it, how it will affect us. So Bob Packwood will be here. The following month is the State of the City Address, date to be, I think, the 15th, but don't tell anybody yet because they're the ones that need to announce it. But March will be, instead of Business and Leaders Luncheon, we will be at the State of the City. So be sure and put that on your calendar. Then we have Lynn Peterson, the Metro Chair. And we also have Maria Pope, Maria Pope, Maria, right? Mar Maria Pope, the new CEO and president of PGE, is on the agenda as well. So we've got a lot coming up. Go home, do good, make money, and come back next month. Thank you very much. <laughs>